ranged against him in his party was a radical wing of a mighty band of powerful, angry, vindictive, unhappy, and humorless men bent on revenge against the slaveholding South. The radicals believed, as Lincoln did, that the war must be pushed to final victory and the rebellion crushed. But Lincoln then wanted a benign, liberal renetting of the shattered Union, free from recrimination and driven by forgiveness of past sins. The radicals were disinclined to be either benign, lenient, or forgiving. They were slavery-hating abolitionists for the most part, and they all deplored the kind-hearted president's meddlesome, soft-headed approach. They wanted vengeance against the South and its slaveholders, an immediate, unconditional freeing of all slaves, and crushing retaliation against their masters, a stern, relentless, pitiless punishment. As someone put it, they were thirsting for a general hanging. Most important, they wanted control of what was to happen and who was to hang. They wanted a South reconstructed and reshaped as they wished it, not as the president wished it. They wanted forever to rely, realign the balance of political power in the Union in favor of the Republican Party. But this well-meaning, kind-hearted, bungling president was standing in their way. It was maddening and frustrating for them. To the man, the radicals were displeased with Lincoln. They thought him wholly incompetent, too slow, too hesitant, too weak, too soft on the South. They believed he lacked backbone encouraged corruption, squandered millions, was a flat failure, and that he must be replaced. These weren't Democrats talking. These were members of Lincoln's own party talking. Nothing the Democrats had ever said of him was worse than what these men in his own party were saying. Owen Lovejoy, an Illinois uh, congressman, compared the president to the driver of a buggy being pulled by a high-spirited steed and leading a nag behind in a halter strap. This was a radical steed of Lovejoy's allegory, champing to pull the driver and buggy rapidly along the road to freedom. But trotting behind the rig was a conservative nag in the halter strap, holding up everything and Lincoln was far too solicitous of the nag, reining in the radical steed to keep it from going too fast for the rest of the apparatus. The radicals in Lincoln's party believed their sole hope for a quick end to the war and subjugation of the South as they wished it was to get rid of this slow driver. He must be replaced in 1864, despite the fact that he was locking up the nomination early and seemed to be generally favored by people, if not by politicians. They were casting around desperately for somebody, anybody, to pit against him. Lincoln's challenge was to keep his contentious party, the steed, the nag, the buggy, and all, moving toward victory, with himself still in the driver's seat at the end. It was not going to be easy, and so much depended on circumstance, particularly how things were going on the battlefield. Now, lest you think the schisms were all in Lincoln's party, let's now look at the Democrats. There, in that party, was a schism that gave new meaning to the word. Like the Republicans, even more so. The democracy, as it was then called, was split into two warring wings. One of these, the war Democrats, agreed with Lincoln about the need to 
to uh, first crush the rebellion. That done, they would then shape a peace that restored the Union as it was, with slavery intact. Or as they put it, the Constitution as it is, the Union as it was, which Lincoln liked to alter slightly to read, the Union as it was, barring the already broken eggs. The other wing of the democracy, the Peace Democrats, also called Copperheads, and likened to venomous snakes poisoning the body politic, wanted an immediate end to the struggle and peace at any price, even if it meant letting the South go its own way. As James Gordon Bennett, the sardonic cross-eyed editor of the New York Herald put the democratic dilemma, they have a peace leg and a war leg, but like a stork by a frog pond, they are as yet undecided which leg to rest upon. Bennett was indeed cross-eyed. One who knew him said that when he looked at me with one eye, he looked out at City Hall with the other. When his enemies who were legion made fun of him for this defect, he snapped that it came from trying to follow their political machinations. The Democratic Party's problem had been relentlessly compounded by defections. Since the war, many union-loving war Democrats had jumped to the new National Union Party, which was the Republican Party, temporarily reshaped and renamed by Lincoln to rally political enemies as well as friends to the Union cause and to broaden the party's political base. The two wings of the de democracy still faithful to their party needed one another. It wouldn't be peaceable staggering along together, screeching at one another, but it was the only way the party could hope to muster enough votes to wrench power back from the Republicans and their highly objectionable president. The Democrats had a terrible problem how to oppose Lincoln without seeming also to oppose the war. In short, it must somehow avoid being tarred with treason. Already there was that odor about their garments, an odor that the Republicans never stopped calling attention to. This is not unique, uh, a problem for opposition, a party, and in wartime, but never was it so acute as in the election campaign that was shaping in 1864. The stakes were high and nearly everybody interpreted the election as a watershed in the Young's Nation's history. Elect Lincoln or any other Union Party candidate and you would get a war waged to the finish, the rebellion crushed, and a slaveless America. Elect a Democratic candidate whoever that might be, and you would get concessions to the South and perhaps a permanently divided nation with slavery still intact. We were talking here about what kind of country this was going to be. That is the way many people saw it. As the year began, a very curious thing was happening in the schism rent Republican or National Union Party, an unthinkable thing unimaginable in any party today with a president running for re-election. One of the president's own cabinet members was running against him. Secretary of the Treasury Salmon Portland Chase, a Republican radical, thought he and not Lincoln ought to be president. He hadn't said as much, hadn't announced his candidacy, but he was running and everybody knew it. As John Hay, one of Lincoln's young secretaries, put it, Chase was busy laying pipe, shaping his huge army of treasury agents into a powerful, dedicated machine for his own candidacy. A former Ohio governor and U.S. senator, Chase had longed to be president for years, maybe since he was born, but at least since 1856 when the new Republican Party ran its first candidate for president who was not Chase 
but John C. Fremont. And when Lincoln was nominated by the Republican Party in 1860, instead of himself, Chase believed it had been some kind of grotesque mistake. He could not conceive that the people could prefer that unknown political bumpkin, Lincoln, to himself. Chase considered Lincoln his woeful inferior. But then Chase believed that about most people. Ohio Senator Ben Wade said Chase believed there were four figures in the Trinity, himself and those three other guys. <laughs> Lincoln had put Chase, a very able man, in his cabinet. Indeed, he had put most of his rivals for the nomination in 1860 into his cabinet. And Chase had begun immediately laying pipe to get the right man himself into the presidency next time. In early 1864, he was the man many radicals were looking to as their best hope for unseating Lincoln. And he was willing. As one observer said, the presidency was glaring out of both of his eyes. Lincoln was fully aware of all this, but professed not to care as long as Chase continued doing his job at Treasury. He told John Hay, I suppose he will like the blue bottle fly, lay his eggs on every rotten spot he can find. But if he becomes president, said the ever forgiving Lincoln, I hope we may never have a worse man. Chase certainly looked presidential. He was tall, majestic in figure, of unbending dignity and statuesque bearing. Lincoln himself said of him, Chase is about one and a half times bigger than any other man that I ever knew. Chase was nearsighted, but it was rumored that each morning as he squinted at himself in the mirror, he said, good morning, Mr. President. Chase had a hard time getting a grip on reality. He was self-deluded, and his one great weakness was that he didn't understand human nature. As somebody said, Mr. Chase is nearsighted. He does not see men. His not-so-secret candidacy, never publicly admitted, very publicly, fell apart in February when his followers, no more realistic than he, put out a circular which said, in effect, that Lincoln was unfit for president and that the logical replacement was Chase. It got wide play in the newspapers and backfired profoundly. Chase denied being a party to it and was mortified, but also he was done for as a candidate, and it forced the radicals to cast somewhere else for somebody to unhorse the president, the Union Party Convention was now only three months away, and it looked sewed up already for Lincoln. The radicals were running out of horses, and they were running out of time. And again, what about the Democrats? The war Democrats still in the party were committed wholesale to George B. McClellan, the former general-in-chief of the Union armies, uh, and Lincoln had sacked McClellan when that overcautious general had failed to pursue and crush Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia after the Battle of Antietam. And immediately, McClellan had become the favored candidate of the war wing of the democracy. He was perfect in their eyes, the one man they might nominate whom the Republicans could not call a traitor. He was charismatic, popular, and ideologically right, a Democrat who thought as they did. He was a famous general, and he was deliciously electable. McClellan, however, may have been one of the more apolitical men ever to run for president. A soldier, he hated politicians, detested them. More than Count Jarowski detested them. Don't send any more damn politicians out here, 
McClellan told one of his political advisors, I'll snub them if they come, confound them. Now that may seem a rather peculiar attitude for a leading candidate for the presidency, but you must understand that McClellan held the basic 19th century non-politician's belief that no man should openly seek the presidency, but that no true man ought to refuse it either if it was spontaneously offered and he was satisfied he could do the country good by accepting it. McClellan's basic strategy all year, up to his nomination in August, uh, was to position himself so that if the nomination was spontaneously offered, he could not refuse to accept it. There's one more name I must introduce into this election year tableau, and that is John C. Fremont. Fremont had been the Republican Party's first candidate for president in 1856 and hadn't made it. He was no great shakes as a politician. He was, however, America's preeminent Western explorer, one of its most heroic and romantic figures. And in the war, he had been a Union general for a time. No great shakes as a general either. Uh, Lincoln finally had sacked him also. Fremont and the radicals had never forgiven Lincoln for this. He was a darling of the radicals. For, nearly in, for early in the war, he had unilaterally freed the slaves of all rebels in Missouri, and Lincoln had countermanded the order. Freeing slaves, particularly in a very delicately balanced border state, such as Missouri, simply wasn't an act whose time had come. Many radicals loved Fremont for doing this, and some had hit on him as a good fallback bet to run against Lincoln in 1864. In early May, a call went out around the country for all men who thought this way to meet in convention in Cleveland to nominate Fremont. No heavy hitters among the radicals attended, however, and it was one of the loosest political convention conventions in our history, lasting one day with no credentials necessary and very little agenda. It was convened solely to nominate Fremont, and it did. He accepted the nomination and said he would abandon it only if the Union Party nominated somebody other than Lincoln. Lincoln's National Union Party met in convention on June 7, a week after the so-called Bolters Convention in Cleveland. Many radicals had tried to get the Union Party convention postponed to buy them more time to figure out how to derail the Lincoln Express. But that didn't work, and by then it was too late to sidetrack the president's renomination. Missouri stubbornly voted for U.S. Grant, who was not a candidate, on the first ballot, but then came around on the second, and Lincoln was nominated unanimously. What gave the Union Convention its excitement was the vice presidential nomination, and thereby hangs the controversy. One version, believed by a large number of historians, holds that Lincoln had decided he needed a different running mate than Hannibal Hamlin. It was just that he believed the ticket would be stronger. He had nothing against Hamlin. He just believed that the ticket would be stronger more representative and broader based with a war Democrat in it. And Hamlin was a radical Republican. In the spring, this version holds, Lincoln had taken a very favorable, favorable look at Ben Butler, a war Democrat from Massachusetts, who was also a major general in the Union Army. As many of you know, there was probably no more inept a general in the entire war than this outrageous of political generals, Ben Butler. But there was probably also no more astute politician in the country, excepting Lincoln himself, and at the time, Butler was very popular in some quarters, not for his generalship, but for his administrative style. He was a gifted, hard-nosed operator 
who wouldn't hesitate to his hang his mother if necessary to get something done. He had a slip throat, hang him high mentality that Lincoln lacked and which endeared him to the radicals. Many thought him an excellent potential replacement for Lincoln. Butler is one of the most interesting figures in the Civil War. One who knew him called him the smartest damned rascal that ever lived. He had always been a rascal. One who had known him since childhood in Deerfield, Massachusetts, remembered him as the dirtiest, sauciest, lyingest child on the road. He was also, like James Gordon Bennett, hopelessly cross-eyed. A fellow Union general said of him, I always think of Ben as a cross-eyed cuttlefish swimming about in waters of his own muddying. <laughs> Butler's talent for muddying waters was prodigious. While the military governor of New Orleans in 1862, he had outraged the South with his hard-nosed policies and he had insulted Southern chivalry by calling ladies of the city ladies of the night. The South called him Beast Butler, and Jeff Davis had a standing order to execute him on the spot if captured. But they loved Butler in the North. He was a man who got things done. He acted decisively and in innovative ways. Lincoln respected him as a politician. And covertly, Butler later testified the president offered him the vice presidency through an intermediary, Simon Cameron, the Republican political boss of Pennsylvania, who was an ex-secretary of war and still a sometime political confidant of the president. Butler reported turning the offer down, jesting that uh, he would take the job only if the president would give him bond with sureties in the full sum of his four years' salary that he would die or resign within three months after his inauguration. Butler swears this happened. Some historians doubt it. After the war, when people asked Butler if he regretted turning down Lincoln's offer, since he would have become president after the assassination, Butler said that had he been on the ticket, Lincoln would never have been assassinated in the first place. What rebel assassin in his right mind would shoot Lincoln to get Butler instead? <laughs> Lincoln, the story goes, then fixed on Andrew Johnson of Tennessee after Butler had turned him down. Johnson was another popular war Democrat who was governor of that part of Tennessee that was now Union held. Johnson had endured in the very furnace of the rebellion and had proved himself courageous and able. Unlike modern presidential candidates, Lincoln didn't announce his choice. He didn't pick his running mate uh, publicly ahead of time or ever. Such things were not done then. Indeed, nobody is sure Lincoln actually dumped Hamlin in favor of Johnson, although many contemporaries testified he did and told them personally that he did. Some of them testified that he sent them to the Union Party Convention in Baltimore to make it happen. We don't know for certain. What we do know is that Johnson was nominated and Hamilton was dropped. After the Baltimore Convention, through the long, hot summer, in contrast to the first half of the year, almost nothing went right for Lincoln. Union arms had met disappointment on the battlefields. Grant had failed to crush Lee's army in the wilderness at Spotsylvania and Cold Harbor and finally had to settle for a long debilitating siege at Petersburg. William T. Sherman was making agonizingly slow progress toward Atlanta. War weariness had become almost more than the North could bear. The Republican radicals 
buoyed by the general pessimism, were making plans for a new convention in Cincinnati to nominate another in Lincoln's stead. One of the ironies of this election campaign was that the worse the war went for the Union, the better the prospects for the Democrats and the better the prospects for the anti-Lincoln radical Republicans as well. Lincoln himself came to believe by the eve of the Democratic Convention in late August that he could not win. And he wrote his famous cabinet memorandum to that effect, something you'll be hearing more of this morning. The Democrats met in Chicago on a wave of euphoria, believing they had this thing wrapped up and won. If only they could get their two warring wings united behind George McClellan on a platform on which they could comfortably stand, or he could comfortably stand. The platform, of course, was the problem. The worst thing about it was that the platform committee was in the hands of the Peace Democrats, mainly the most infamous copperhead in the country, Clement Willandingham of Ohio. So in uh, the end, the War Democrats got their nominee, McClellan, and the Peace Democrats designed the platform and put in it a plank that turned out to be monumentally disastrous. The plank called the war a failure and demanded immediate peace negotiations with the South. The Democrats, as was their nature, had been their nature before and, was, and has been their nature since, had the most unruly and quixotic of conventions. As Will Rogers many years later said, I belong to no organized party, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> the Peace Democrats could barely stomach McClellan. Among those who couldn't was Benjamin Harris, uh, a Copperhead congressman from Maryland, a loose cannon who had been censured by the House in the past for so-called treasonable language. A delegate to the convention, Harris took the floor when nominations were being made and, uh, and was ostensibly trying to second the nomination of his preferred candidate, a Copperhead ex-governor of Connecticut named Thomas H. Seymour. But what he did was to veer from that into a tirade against McClellan that soon had delegates leaping to their feet and gavels pounding. Harris charged that one of the men whom you have nominated, McClellan, is a tyrant. General McClellan was the very first man who inaugurated a system of usurping state rights, Harris said. Maryland, he shouted through the rising bedlam on the floor, has been cruelly trampled upon by this man, and I cannot consent as a delegate from the state to allow his nomination to go unopposed. We shall never, never consent that the state of Maryland shall be so dishonored. Well, Harris read letters from floor in which McClellan as a general in chief of the Union armies had ordered the arrest of the entire Maryland legislature on grounds it was seditious. Harris wouldn't shut up about it. All the charges you can make against Abraham Lincoln and against Benjamin Butler, he said, I can make and sustain against this man, George B. McClellan. Great excitement thundered through the hall. Delegates sprang to their feet and glared menacingly at Harris as he made his way back down to his seat. Somebody shouted near him, shouted, you're a damn traitor. Hearing that, Harris turned on the nearest delegate, a New Yorker, who was perhaps wholly innocent and delivered a haymaker. The next day, McClellan was nominated despite Harris. A Copperhead congressman from Ohio named George Pendleton was named his running mate to balance the ticket. This coupling was rather like having a leg each on two horses running in opposite directions. As the delegates adjourned, 
One of them was overheard mumbling that the nominee for president is a nobody and the candidate for vice president is a putty head. <laughs> Whatever they were, they were theirs. And the very next day, as the war Democrats were leaving Chicago, Sherman took Atlanta. He wired Lincoln that Atlanta is ours and fairly won. It was a stunning stump speech, perhaps the most telling one-liner ever uttered in American politics, and ironically uttered by a general and one of the most virulent non-politicians in our history. After the war, when touted as a candidate himself, it was Sherman who said, nominated, I will not run. Elected, I will not serve. In no American election before or since have the prospects flip-flopped so suddenly, so dramatically, and so devastatingly following such few simple words, Atlanta is ours and fairly won. No plank ever looked so hollow as a war failure prank the Democrats had just adopted and were now stuck with. From utter pessimism, the Republicans were catapulted overnight into heady optimism. This had turned the election into a wholly new ball game. McClellan, after agonizing over six rewrites of the acceptance statement, repudiated the plank, then accepted the nomination, something not generally done. Lincoln ordered a day of national thanksgiving, not for McClellan's nomination, but for the fall of Atlanta, and the campaign began. By the end of September, the field in both parties had been cleared away and tidied up. Republican radicals, thoroughly outmaneuvered by Lincoln, with help from Sherman, and left with no alternative, climbed reluctant and grumbling aboard his bandwagon. The Peace Democrats and Copperheads, with their war failure plank repudiated by their candidate, also with help from Sherman, but also with nowhere else to go, came out of their sulking tents to campaign reluctantly for McClellan. And John C. Fremont was persuaded grudgingly to call off his third party candidacy. The tracks were cleared, and now the mud started to fly. The Democrats grabbed up one issue after another, and absolutely nothing was sticking. They called Lincoln a tyrant and a usurper of civil rights. They called the Republicans a bunch of miscegenationists and complained of vote fraud. Republicans, on the other hand, pounded away on one simple issue, treason. They painted the entire Democratic Party with the label, and it was sticking. The campaign itself was down and dirty. All the crack orders of both parties hurled invective night and day from every stump, street corner, wagon bed, and platform. Very little of it was issue driven. One thing this very different election had in common with most others before and since. Even the Confederates were stumping in the campaign out of Canada and had been for months trying to influence peace-minded voters, trying to incite insurrection, trying to buy northern editors, anything to get a change of administration in the North that would give them at least an outside chance to win the independence they were failing to win on the battlefield. They knew they were losing the war. Their only hope now, a slim one at best, was to defeat Lincoln. The major newspapers in the country were, of course, in the middle of it, shoveling out unsolicited criticism, advice, and editorial opinion, much of it against Lincoln. Inspecting a gun one day that was designed to prevent the escape of gas, Lincoln said, well, I believe this really does what it is represented to do. Now, have any of you heard of any machine or invention for preventing the escape of gas from newspaper establishments? <laughs> the newspaper editors, 
who we like to think of as impartial, were not just generating gas. Many of them were in the thick of the campaign as political activists. The Union Party chairman and Lincoln's campaign manager was, uh, was, campaigning, was, was running the campaign and, called, called, and Lincoln called him my general in politics. The only people not participating in the election were like the candidates themselves. And that's the way it was in those days. It was considered unseemly uh, lest he be betrayed into saying something indiscreet. Can you imagine that? <laughs> well, to make, uh, to make this long story mercifully shorter, Lincoln won the election, the first successful Democratic, Democrat, small, day, small d, election ever conducted anywhere in the world in the midst of a civil war. Lincoln won by 411,000 votes of the more than 4 million cast, about 55%, which was comfortable enough. Well, I'm going to need to cut this short, so I will just say that, that the election over what had made the difference. The common wisdom says that the election was won for Lincoln when Sherman took Atlanta and when Sheridan routed the Confederates in the Shenandoah Valley in mid-September. Events seemed to support the common wisdom and Lincoln might have agreed with it himself. The victories on the battlefield certainly changed the prospects for Lincoln and his party, but the president might have won anyhow, often overlooked because there were no polls in that day, was a deep reservoir of support and affection for him among the common people in the country. There was something about that ungainly, honest, and kindly man that resonated with the little man of the North. This feeling was reflected in many of the small newspapers of the country who never lost faith in him. And there was that disastrous war failure plank. Lincoln might have won anyhow. I rather think he would have, but we will never know. Lincoln has his own take on why he lost, or why he won, I'm sorry. I am here, he told a friend after the election, by the blunders of the Democrats. If instead of resolving that the war was a failure, they had resolved that I was a failure and denounced me for not more vigorously prosecuting it, I should not have been re-elected. I'm not so sure about that either. That was exactly the strategy of Lincoln's enemies in his own party, and it hadn't done them much good. I think the bottom line is that his enemies in and out of the party had gone up against one of the sharpest politicians in our history, and he had simply eaten their lunch. Oh, that's the end. I think you want to leave room for some questions. Come back next year and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a few things I left out. Uh, a couple of questions are in order. Yes, ma'am. Well, let's, let's say Atlantic happens a couple of months later. Uh, who do you think would have been the front runner of all those interesting characters you were telling us about to, to actually have a shot? Well, I mean, yeah, technically it was down to McClellan, but. Yeah, the, the, the big problem is that the radicals couldn't agree on anybody. And uh, I don't think they could have come up with anybody that could have carried the people. And I think they knew it. I think uh, 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 in their hearts they knew that they couldn't beat Lincoln at the polls. And uh, I don't think any of those guys, Chase had, had, had worn himself out. Fremont was not really a, a viable option. And uh, Sam and Chase had pretty much uh, self-exploded. I, 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 don't, I don't think that, uh, I, don't, I think it would have gone like it did. I think Lincoln would have run anyhow, and I think he would have been elected. Now, now not, not all historians agree with me on that point. And I think you will get a speech later today that says, uh, talks about Sh Sherman and Atlanta, the campaign that won the election for Lincoln. Well, that, that's, that's the common wisdom. Uh, I just happened to think he would have won anyhow. One more? Anybody? 
Yes, yes, ma'am. David Blight in his uh, Yale University lectures talks about Lincoln's meeting with Frederick Douglass when he starts to think that he's going to lose the election. Can you speak a little bit on that? It's when the plan to get more slaves out of the South, should he lose? I'm sorry, would you say that again? David Blight in his Yale University lecture series talks about when Lincoln starts thinking he's going to lose the 64 election, that he meets with Frederick Douglass to ferry slaves out of the South fearing he'd fail. Yeah, I think there's, there's, there's uh, truth in that because uh, Lincoln was checking with everybody, you know, uh, uh, knowing that he was in danger. He was talking to everybody. And Douglas by this time had become a friend of his. I remember when Douglas first came to, to visit Lincoln that uh, when he left, he said that Lincoln was the only man, uh, great man he had ever met who didn't see a difference in himself between himself and Douglas, the difference of color. And, uh, but, but Lincoln was checking with everybody. And I think that it's very possible that, that they were talking about certainly, certainly getting more uh, uh, black soldiers under arms. As it was, there were 180 black regiments in the North before the war ended. And even the South was thinking of using slaves in their armies. So I think it's very, very li likely that he did talk to Douglas. Does that answer your question? Okay. 